Hi everyone, welcome to Chapter 1, Video 1, which will cover Sections 1.1 and 1.2 in your Anatomy and Physiology textbook. Our goals for this course are to learn about the structure and function of the human body. This information is going to be really important if you're pursuing a career in medicine or any healthcare fields, if you're interested in exercise science or pathology, which is the study of disease when something goes wrong in the body, and several other related fields. Chapter one is broken down into five different videos. This is the first, and in this first video, we'll be talking about the definitions of anatomy and physiology and some of the early history of medicine. The second video for chapter one will talk about the scientific method. The third video will talk about the evolution of humans and an overview of human body structure. The fourth video for chapter one will be about an overview of human body function. And finally, we'll finish with um, some brief information about the language of medicine. As I mentioned, this video is related to sections 1.1 and 1.2 in your anatomy and physiology textbook. Section 1.1 has three discrete learning goals. First, we want to be able to define anatomy and physiology and tell the difference between the two. Then we're gonna talk about several different techniques we can use when we're studying anatomy. And finally, we want you to be able to describe at least a few of the specialties within the field of physiology by the time you finish this video. The second half of this video is about section 1.2 from the textbook. And after watching this video, you should be able to describe how uh, the fields of science and medicine moved from uh, a basis in superstition to our current view of biomedical research. And also, uh, at the end of this video, we want you to be able to relate the stories of several key scientists who made major contributions to the field of anatomy and physiology. So first of all, we can define anatomy as the study of form. Very broadly, what do we see? What do we observe when we look at a living thing? Physiology, on the other hand, is the study of how things work or function. So if we look at a real quick example here, uh, we can study the anatomy of muscles. We can see how the muscles are connected to each other. We can see uh, what the muscle fibers look like, what direction the muscle fibers run. And then studying the physiology of muscles would be about how those muscles work to control the body at the macroscopic level where we're just looking with our, our naked eyes to see uh, what observations we can make. Also looking at the microscopic scale where we see striated muscle as you can see in the, the picture uh, in the middle of the diagram. And also physiology is about the biochemistry of how muscle contraction works or uh, more broadly the biochemistry of how any organ system in our body works. Anatomy and physiology are generally studied together. It's very difficult to, to separate these two disciplines. There are generally four ways that we can examine the human body. Okay. First, we can just look at things. We call this inspection. We can feel things with our hands, that's called palpation. We can listen to the sounds of the bodies, and that's auscultation. And finally, we can tap on different parts of the body to feel for resistance or air or fluid pockets or for scar tissue, and we call that percussion. So if you think of a general uh, well person exam, uh, a physician is gonna do each of these things. Uh, they, they might look and see, um, are there any skin infections? Is the color of a person's eyes normal? Or are, is there yellowing color that might indicate jaundice or liver problems? A physician may feel your stomach to see if any organs such as your liver or your spleen feel enlarged. 
A physician can listen to the sounds of your body, your heartbeat, listen to your lungs, listen to the digestive sounds coming from your intestines. And percussion could be things like tapping on your knee to observe the reflex. Another way that we can study anatomy is by dissection of cadavers. When we use a deceased human to cut apart and separate those body tissues to see the relationships between the body tissues. And finally, we can look at several different species and compare the different anatomical forms that different species have and how they're similar in difference. And we call this comparative anatomy. This is actually what I teach at the University of South Carolina. And it gives us clues about how the functions might be similar and different in different species and also about the evolutionary relationships that different species have. Some other ways that we can study anatomy are exploratory surgery. And guys, this is usually done as a last resort. We generally don't like to do any sort of surgery unless we already know what we're looking for. So if a person ex is experiencing lots of unexplained pain or uh, other symptoms after all other, other tests are uh, done and found to be negative or inconclusive, exploratory surgery may be considered as a last option. Medical imaging is a much better option. It allows us to look inside the body without doing invasive surgeries. And we're going to be talking a lot more about this later in chapter one. Uh, radiology is the specific branch of medicine that is concerned with all types of imaging. Gross anatomy is simply what we can see with the naked eye. It's not involving microscopes or um, any sort of uh, equipment to see inside the body. So for instance, a compound fracture where the bone, broken bone is protruding through the skin. We could make a diagnosis of a broken bone just using gross anatomy. We wouldn't need to do any uh, imaging to make that diagnosis. Now, imaging could be useful, the form of x-rays or MRIs, in order to make a game plan for repairing that injury. But gross anatomy could be used to make the diagnosis in that case. Histology is looking at tissues, and that allows us to, um, to see different tissues under a microscope and look for anomalies in those tissues. Histopathology, would be making diagnosis of disease based on what we see with the microscope. Cytology is one level smaller. That's looking at the structure and function of cells. And if the cells are working properly or if there's some dysfunction at the cellular level. And finally, our smallest available imaging is ultrastructure. And we use an electron microscope to see all the way down to the molecular level. Remember that one of our goals for this section is to gain an understanding of some of the subdisciplines of physiology. So three that are especially, introduced, especially interesting are neurophysiology, which is the physiology or the function of the nervous system, endocrinology, which is the study of the interactions of hormones and how they work and impact different tissues and organs in the body, and pathophysiology, which is where we study uh, how different dysfunctions result in disease and symptoms of disease. Comparative physiology is similar to comparative anatomy, where we're looking at body functions across several species. And by doing this, we can get big clues in evolutionary conservation of different functions and a better understanding of how species evolved. In terms of medicine and um, human anatomy and physiology, this is a really great tool to help us uh, develop new drugs and medical procedures. Next, we're gonna look at some of the historical physicians and scientists who made major contributions to our current understanding of anatomy and physiology. The first one is Hippocrates. I think everybody has heard of Hippocrates at some point in time. He was a Greek physician. He lived from 460 to 375 BCE, and everybody knows him for the Hippocratic Oath. 
something that's really interesting. Everybody thinks that the Hippocratic Oath is first do no harm. I would really encourage you guys to look up the modern version of the Hippocratic Oath. You can also look up the classical version. They're both really easy to Google. Nowhere in there is first do no harm. It's not part of the Hippocratic Oath. It's more of a TV sitcom thing that, that we get that phrasing. Hippocrates big thing was urging physicians to use science rather than superstition to uh, figure out what was going on when people had different diseases. There, there was an idea at the time that was very prevalent that the gods or the demons were either punishing or were attacking people who had disease, and Hippocrates really urged people to use science instead. Aristotle lived from 384 to 322 BCE, and he believed that there were some diseases that had supernatural causes, but other diseases had physiological causes, and his uh, physiology uh, is the root word that gave us the words physician and our English word physiology. And one of his big contributions was his belief that simple parts, what we now might call cells, were built up to make complex structures. The next person who was super important, his name was Claudius Galen, and his claim to fame is he was the physician to the Roman gladiators. And in that role, he was able to study a lot of human anatomy as he uh, tried to heal a lot of really gruesome injuries. In Galen's time, it was illegal and very taboo to use human cadavers or deceased humans in the study of medicine or for any sort of dissections. And this came from a really disturbing past of... Um, Romans doing public dissections, and also dissections of living slaves and prisoners. And this led to a ban on all human dissections. So Galen was forced to do most of his study with animals. And in a sense, he was doing comparative anatomy. He was looking at the structures that he observed in animals and trying to extrapolate how they related to human anatomy. So this was comparative anatomy. He made a lot of assumptions in similarities between animals and humans, and this led to some bad information, but overall he still made a lot of major contributions to our understanding of human anatomy. Galen stated his own findings should be examined critically and not taken just purely on faith. Unfortunately, this advice was not heeded. Uh, texts by Galen were used in an almost religious fashion for about 1,500 years, and we'll see in a few minutes why that had some negative consequences. Up until uh, about the 1600s, uh, Christian countries and Christian cultures prevented a lot of scientific progress from being made. However, Jewish and Muslim cultures were much more supportive of inquiry and scientific study. So, uh, Maimonides, who lived from 1135 to 1204, was a Jewish physician, and he actually served as the physician to the Egyptian sultans after he fled, uh, fled Spain for religious persecution. He wrote 10 medical texts that were very influential of uh, medical practice and medical study. Avicenna, who was also called Ibn Sina, was a Muslim scholar, and his work specifically in anatomy and uh, related fields contributed to medicine in the Middle East being pretty superior to medical practice in Europe. Uh, at the time that he lived in the 16 and 1700s. He wrote a textbook called The Canon of Medicine that was used for more than 500 years. Medical art is really important for our understanding of both anatomy and physiology. 
think about the, the different textbooks that you've had over the years in middle school or high school or other science classes and how much the illustrations and the diagrams contributed to your understanding of the, the content. In some cases, a good figure or a good drawing can be uh, more useful than a paragraph or a page of text. So let's talk about some of the major contributions to medical art. Vesalius was one of the first major contributors to medical art with his book on the structure of the human body. And part of the reason his book was so influential is because he did his own dissections. And that sounds kind of silly. Like, why wasn't everyone doing their own dissections if by the, the time that Vesalius lived, some of the restrictions on dissecting cadavers had been restricted? Let me tell you just for a second here how dissections were, were done in Vesalius's time. So the medical professor would sit in a tall chair reading a Latin medical text. And while he was reading, there were these barber surgeons, okay? And the re reason they were both barbers and surgeons was because there was some uh, thought at that time that cutting of hair and cutting of the body were similar enough that those professions were really one in the same. Sounds a little weird to us, I know, but that's how it was back then. So these barber surgeons were dissecting these decaying, putrefying bodies while these poor medical students watched and tried not to vomit. Now, keep in mind, there was no embalming, there was no refrigeration, so imagine the stench of this and these decomposing organs being lifted out by these barber surgeons one by one. Also, keep in mind, there's no good hand washing, uh, there's no gloves. The, this was really kind of a, a gruesome procedure that was going on here. But Vesalius did his own dissections rather than sit up in a, a tall chair and watch other people do the dissections. And he actually corrected a lot of Galen's mistakes that he made because he was uh, extrapolating from animal dissections up to humans. So his book that was published in 1543 uh, was much more accurate than the previous medical texts that were available. So Harvey. William Harvey uh, did more work with physiology and how the body functioned. Uh, his major contributions were in understanding of the circulatory system and how blood flows through the veins and arteries and back to the heart and out to the veins and arteries again. And he wrote a book on the motion of the heart that summarized these findings. Uh, he also did work in embryology later in his career. So less about art and more about visualizations, we have Robert Hooke. And Robert Hooke was the first guy to make a compound microscope or a microscope that has two lenses, one up near the eye and one down near the specimen. And this allows to control for uh, both coarse and fine focus. If you've used a microscope and it had two knobs to turn, one for coarse focus and one for fine focus, that's the type of compound microscope that Hook started to design. His microscope could only magnify things 30 times though. That was his maximum capacity. But even with that 30 time magnification, he was able to see cells. For the first time in human history, we could see cells and he gave them the name cells. Then we had this other guy, his name was Leeuwenhoek, and Leeuwenhoek was not a scientist at first. He was a textile merchant, and he was trying to make a tool that would help him gauge the quality of fabric better. So he made a single lens microscope that was able to magnify 200 times with just that one single lens. And he was able to do that because he was just really good, had really good technique for manufacturing lenses. When he figured out how good his microscope was, he started looking at everything he could find under a microscope. Um, one of his famous quotes is from looking at a drop of rainwater and seeing this huge variety of microbes moving around, and he called them little animalcules. 
the word microorganism wasn't uh, around at that time. So he just started looking at everything he could get his hands on, and then he would draw pictures of it, and then he would publish it. And next we have uh, two guys. These guys lived in the 1800s. Their names were Scheidlin and Schwann. And um, their big contribution was the conclusion that all living things are made of cells. So this was um, the beginning of cell theory that we're going to be talking about more in chapter two. Scheinland was a botanist and Schwann was a zoologist and they worked together and examined a wide variety of living things and they concluded that if it's alive it must be made of cells. So this was a survey of the big advancements in medicine through the 1800s when most doctors had little formal training in anatomy or science in general. Medicine at this time was hyperfixated in removing toxins from the body by bleeding or leaching or inducing sweating, vomiting, or diarrhea. At this time, there was no sanitation, no clean water, uh, no understanding of microscopic pathogens. But the scientists up to this time and at this time paved the way for our understanding of science and anatomy and physiology and medicine that we have today. From the 1800s on, we had huge advancements in genetics and microbiology and sanitation and biochemistry and our understanding of DNA and nutrition. And all of these things built on the foundation we just described led to the advancements in health and well-being and longevity that we have today.